What you're about to watch is a friendly debate between two of my friends, Doran Shafrir and a YouTuber who goes by the name of Socrates. In this debate, Socrates is critical of Israeli policies and Doran is supportive of Israeli policies. While I listened to them discuss the issues, I was really able to get a deeper understanding of the reasons why people see things differently when it comes to Israel-Palestine. I hope that you enjoy this discussion, and if you do, please feel free to subscribe. So what do you actually believe? Because my just to state first my perspective and then see what you have that kind of matches matches against that. For, for me, this concept of we can have security um, as long as we have our boot securely placed against their neck, as long as they can't stand up because we're standing on them, as long as we have enough soldiers, we have enough checkpoints, enough walls keeping them penned in, as long as we bomb their infrastructure enough that they can't build anything that they could use to attack us with, as long as we keep doing that, then we will be safe. To me, that's fundamentally a losing strategy. Ah, so to the, me it isn't. Okay. I, I mean, I would just, I would just not, uh, I would remove the last part of what you've said about bombing them every once in a while, okay. right? Mm -hmm. I would remove that, but like, I, mm -hmm. I would say that, yeah, when you have power over a hostile population, uh, basically, as long as there is belligerence, uh, an occupation should continue. I think also that's so, international law, by the way. Sure. Do you do you do you believe that? So um, to to state the, the rest of my position in terms of the positive case, hmm. um, I'm not I'm not so naive to say, well, if you take away all the walls, suddenly this population that hates you because of what you've done to them will suddenly stop hating you, and it'll it'll suddenly become a paradise, and everybody will live in peace, and everything will be wonderful. I'm not I'm not saying that. I want I want to be clear, but in order to move to a situation with real peace, real security, and yes, justice is also important, then you have to normalize relations. You have to move toward living together as equals. You need to give people back dignity and human rights and self-autonomy. And that's the only way forward toward lasting peace. And if a group of people says, we will keep our foot on their neck until they simply stop resisting. My interpretation of that statement is to say, we will keep our foot on their neck until they die. That's, that's my interpretation of what that says. Because if you say we will never give them dignity, human rights, until they simply become utterly passive, to me, the clear interpretation is ethnic cleansing or genocide or something like that. If you say, I have no plan to ever move toward peace or, or justice until they're just utterly passive. Okay, so a couple of things about that. Uh, first off, about the... Um... Okay, I'll start at the, at the end, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, that you said basically you have no intention of ever removing your boot from their neck. Um, I would love for Israel to remove its book, uh, its boot from their necks, um, but I do think that there needs to be some radical reform. And when I say radical, I mean you know extreme. I don't mean necessarily like Islamist. Uh, a radical reform within uh, Palestinian society in, in order to enable that, because right now. Uh, from what I see in the papers, in the uh, you know the widespread opinions, it's it's basically you can't Re resistance is such a value and martyrdom is such a value in there that you you just can't do that. That would be suicide. How do you reform a society? I have no idea. Espe especially when uh, you know they uh, they keep being egged on by the rest of the Muslim world, right? Um, so, so that's about that. I, I can't give you a solution, but I know what what is the wrong solution. I think the wrong solution is uh, let's kumbaya, which you've also kind of uh, said yourself. Now, as for the other thing, um, here's the problem with the the main uh, with the belief that you know their lives are miserable, they'll resist, they'll, they'll do whatever. And I think 
really what you what you would have to do in order to debunk that view is to imagine a world in which there is no occupation and see what happens but luckily you have several years of israel's existence right without occupation and you see what happens so uh, you you have basically here's the thing the uh, arab narrative is always always feels like victory is imminent that's basically october 7 right victory is imminent we're destroying the zionist entity now this is the end days right but it's also it's also been the narrative in 48 right why did the civil war start the, the on, in 47 because the arabs believed that they could remove the the jews and like you know abolish the zionist idea there was no occupation then right now i'm not saying that you know, sins of the fathers, right? You, you don't inherit the sins of your fathers, but in a certain way, you also kind of do. Because the Palestinians of today, which I don't like this, by the way, they're still paying for their abs the absolute failures of their leaderships, uh, in, uh, successive leaderships in the past 75 years, or more actually, right? And even before, even before the partition plan, there were... Uh, conspiracy theories against the Jews are trying to take over Al-Aqsa Mosque, for example. That's what caused the Hebron massacre of 2029, 20, right? 1929. So it's not just the occupation. There's this fundamental hostility. Uh, it's, you know, I've spoken to a, uh, an American Muslim a couple of days ago when he told me something interesting. He told me that, the, uh, that there's this, thing about, this uh, thing about the Palestinians that when they need to unleash Islam, they crack it open a little bit and then they close it when it fit, when it fits them, right? So there's this, they know how to inspire this worldwide religious fervor. Um, and then they feel like victory is imminent. They start a war to destroy Israel and then they lose badly. And what do they get? They get the Nakba or they get what's happening today in Gaza. So I really, you know, it's not that I like it. I don't, <laughs> I don't want to destroy anyone's lives, but I don't think Israel should commit suicide by by essentially, you know, turning the other chick chick. So from your perspective, is there anything that Israel could do to improve relations between Israelis and Palestinians? Well, I'm because so I glad haven't, I haven't heard anything. But, I'm but so glad you've asked that. Yeah. I'm so glad that you, you that mm -hmm. you asked that. Yes, uh, I do believe that Israel is missing something big time. Uh, there are, there are not many, there are very few, but there are, uh, Palestinian reformist voices. They're small, they're far in bet between, um, but they exist. And Israel, I think, should embrace them instead of silencing them. So that's how I see it. There are, there are voices being heard. Uh, these people, unfortunately, they won't talk to me or they, when they talk to me, they would hide their faces because it's dangerous in the Palestinian territories to talk like that mm -hmm. uh, but in a conciliatory manner. But, you know, uh, yes, yeah, so I do think that there are things that Israel should do because I, right, I don't see like a Palestinian state, state in the foreseeable future ever being anything other than suicide for Israel, right? But if we were to imagine a situation in which, you know, a, a, the old hatred of the old generations is dead because these generations are dead and the new generations, you know, they can get along and they can do business and whatever, uh, you know, there, sh there shouldn't really be any difference. You know, if you have the, uh, the people who are today settlers, they can live in Palestine. You know, who cares? It's like French people living in, in Brussels. Who cares? You know, so so. Who cares that they're living in Belgium? That's what I mean. Yeah. Or right, it, it would be living in like Algeria or something, right? I yeah, guess yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but well, Algeria, it's not exactly. Okay. Yeah. But, you know, Algeria is more different than uh, <laughs> to, to France than Belgium is. But my point is there's actually a lot of common, commonalities between Jews and Muslims. A lot of commonalities. And when I speak to Muslims, I, I find that out. Of course. But, but the... Um, the conversation, and you know, it, it's it it exists to a certain extent extent on the on the Israeli side, but it's unimaginably worse on the Palestinian side. That the power is held by the people who would never say these things. 
and who would never be conciliatory and who would never try to challenge the narrative of guys maybe we were being idiots here maybe this was actually something that we should have done you know it's always you start a war with the intention of annihilating this, this, the zionist state and then you when you lose you 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 know oh my god the nakba what did they do to us oh my god uh, look at gaza you know it's it's kind of absurd but but i uh, it was a great question so thanks for asking okay. so 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 propping up um more moderate uh palestinian leaders um this is actually not a leading question but just a a, to a totally genuine question what do, what do you think about um uh marwan bagudi um who the the former um shin bet leader said he could be the kind of um palestinian mandela um we should free him from from jail he's somebody who could compete politically against um hamas who's both popular um with palestinians and also could be a, a moderate reforming voice yeah uh, so I, I don't have a strong opinion that this isn't uh so i i'm not entirely sure who that guy is but i think i recognize the name i think it's a, a disgrace that the shin bet guy said such a thing oh, uh, why is that because if i remember correctly this guy is like he planned several terrorist attacks he was active in men like you I don't think you can go sure, okay I when mean, I was when I was speaking about like Palestinian re reform mm -hmm. voices I was thinking about people like well I don't exactly remember the names but I think there's this guy called is it Hamza Youssef no that's the Scotland prime minister right mm -hmm. uh, sure but, but I mean who is it um who's the, the Israeli minister is it Smotrich or or Ben Gavir who is the, the minister of what terrorist? um uh Smotrich is the finance minister. Yeah. Ben Gavir is um, minister of national security. I think of Ben Gavir, right, who was convicted of terrorism by Israel. Yeah, but it's look, right? it's not so, the same. So, it's so not people, the same. Look, um, okay, terrorism because because it's different. Okay, it's different. I don't like I don't like Israeli terrorists. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay let's make this clear. But it's a different thing to say uh, I'm going to plan some sort of crazy uh, operation to i don't know uh, scare palestinians or whatever you, you know be, it, it's not it's not the same scale of terrorist activi activity well, as planning a suicide bombing on a bus sure it's not so the he, same so he he's a big fan of um uh his his ideology is basically modeled after i'm trying to trying to remember his, his name Ismail Kahana yeah, yeah, yeah. Kahana, who who shot the Israeli prime minister. So that's no, 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 no. That's Igal Amir. That's that's Amir. Okay. Um, but but Kahana, I, yeah, yeah. Um, Kahana headed headed uh, basically a, a radical um, uh, Jewish party. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was in the seventies. I might be wrong, but mm -hmm. around that time. But so, 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 who are these? Who are these moderate leaders then that you think? should be should be oh problem. they're not leaders that's the thing okay. that's the problem they're not leaders but there are voices you know as far as i'm concerned okay what i'm saying here obviously has some problems because in the palestinian territories if you're suspected of collaborating with israel they will lynch you pretty much on the spot mm -hmm. like i think uh, in the first intifada i think that more palestinians killed more palestinians than jews because they suspect them of collab of collaboration, you know, and it's like a very bad atmosphere. So it it probably couldn't. There will need to be some sophistication to it. I I I don't know. Like I haven't thought of it so that deeply. But there are people, as far as I'm concerned, any person who you see a video of him on TikTok saying something like, "Why does Hamas do that? What we should be doing is actually this," and and it's something that Israel could actually live with. Israel should check out what is this guy thinking maybe sure. we should help well, him be heard isn't isn't this the the critical thing so so if i if i ask to some to somebody who's in conflict with someone else and i ask okay you guys have a conflict you say you you want to resolve it and you're serious about resolving it okay that's wonderful it'll, it'll be great to have peace between the two of you so that you don't kill each other or one of you doesn't kill the other obviously that's the right the right thing to do um but if i ask you know what can you do on your end to reform if the answer is well the other guy needs to reform before i can do anything there's nothing on my end 
I think most people would say this is not a satisfactory answer. You're not serious about peace. Um, so I think this is the, the critical thing then to, to think about, because if you're Israeli, if you're supportive of Israel um, to, the, to the detriment of being supportive of, of Palestinians, if your focus is on support for, for Israel and you see yourself aligned with Israel, you relate to Israel, you don't relate to Palestinians, okay, that's great. It's fine. You don't have to be relating to everybody all the time. But if you relate to Israel, if you're Israeli, and you say, we're serious about peace, we're serious about justice, we want things to improve, then surely the only thing that matters is what can I do from my side to improve the situation? If you say it's all on them to, to totally change before I could ever conceive of doing anything, then I think it's, it's reasonable for me to say, well, I, I don't think you're serious about this, right? Is that a fair? Yeah, that's a great objection. I'll, I'll try to answer it. Uh, I think that because Israel is a democratic and open society, it would be easier to create gradual changes of opinion um, and of public opinion, right? Basically reform, right? I mean, you don't really need ref reform in a democratic society. You know what I mean? Like th th something will happen and it will kind of leak into the public conscious theoretically, right? But uh, so what I would say is that because Israeli society is open and it debates and it discusses, um, I would I would expect that if the Palestinians would have changed would change their tones into something that is more in alignment with something that the Israelis could live with. Uh, I would expect to see a change in Israeli tone, just as, by the way, whenever Hamas has acted violently in the past, uh, there has been a change in Israeli tone in the opposite direction, right? But I Doran, mean, Doran, you're yeah. saying that it's up to the Palestinians to change their tone before mm -hmm. Israel can change it. Okay, well, actually, so yes, but I think Israel could somehow help that process along. So... So I think so. So what you're what you're saying in terms of propping up moderate voices, I think that makes sense. I think that's a reasonable stance. But I think um, for for me, this idea that it's like, well, maybe this is something I guess theoretically we could do. I'm not quite sure. It's a it's a vague idea. I haven't really thought it through. Should shouldn't that be something? I don't mean you personally, Doran, individually. That this is on you exactly to figure this out for Israel. But shouldn't this be, shouldn't, it, isn't this the whole thing? Is it for Israel to say, we want to resolve this, shouldn't they be at least working on, on a plan? And if, if they say, well, we don't really have like a concrete idea, I haven't thought about it that much. So I'll be honest with you. I think, I, I can't prove it. I'm, I'm just saying what I think, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that Israel actually was trying to do it. Uh, I think that Netanyahu was trying to do it, but he could never say it out loud because of, because of the, he's associated with the right wing and his, uh, yeah. yeah, and also his political partners. Um, I think that normalization with the Saudis would have probably meant some, um, you know, Gulf state force or a help with administration or and some sort of reform to the PA. I mean, Gaza is out of your control. Well, now it wouldn't be out of your control, but. Pre-October 7th, it was out of your control. So I think Israeli actually was trying to achieve something like this. Uh, and I think the reason why, uh, uh, you know, all the Qatari money that went into Gaza and all the uh, mm -hmm. uh, things that went behind everyone's back with the Gulf states, I think that Israel was are you, eventually... Are you talking about the, the, the money that um, Netanyahu got to, to go to Hamas? Yes, the, yes. I believe, I believe that, that Netanyahu... Well, it's going to it's it, it exploded in his face, right? But I believe that Netanyahu believed uh, that he was going for some long term maneuver mm -hmm. that would first bypass the Palestinian problem and then solve it after after Israel has normalized relations and not just normalized, but also instituted a good business partnership with the Gulf states. That's what I mm -hmm. think he was trying to do. And I think he wanted it to be his legacy. And well, now it's going to have a different legacy. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's there's always there's always two camps. When things are hardest, there's people who say um, peace is now unachievable in this moment. 
because things are so bad, because tensions are so high, because conflict is so high, violence is so high, there's nothing that can be done. We have to wait for a better season for peace. And there's other voices that say, because things are so bad right now, we must, must find peace. So there's, um, there's an idea that, so if you look at, um, and I, I don't want to go too much into, into the details because we're, we're, we're nearing maybe the end of our time. We can stay a little bit after, uh, after the hour. But, um, you know, first, first intifada, relatively nonviolent expression of at you the want start, change. at the at, start, at, at, at the start. Second intifada, very bloody, very violent. And what changed is that the um, the peace talks fell through. The hope of a new, better, permanent situation being achieved between Israel and Palestinians, some kind of is some kind of Palestinian state. That hope um, was was dashed, fell through. Um, there's a there's a hopeful view that um, that a hope for a better a better situation, a better setup, a better arrangement for all people. If that's achievable, that's something for people to look to, to to put their hopes into. And rather than thinking about just resistance and agitation for uh, for recognition and to say the situation is unlivable because that's what that's what these acts are. It's an expression of this is intolerable. This is unlivable. I would rather carry out a suicide bombing than continue to live in this situation. That's an expression that things are unlivable. But the hope that things genuinely can change, I see that as the only thing that can meaningfully impact what's happening right now and give people a different thing to focus on. Um, I, can't, I can't imagine that you disagree with that. I, I know that you have concerns. I know that you have security concerns. I know that you have um, maybe some, um, some, some lack of hope that that can be achieved right now. I actually um, did disagree with the narrative that you've presented. Okay. What's your, yeah, what's your, what's your disagreement with that? So you've essentially said, what, like, you've presented the idea that the second Intifada was bloodier than the first because of the failure of the peace talks. Uh, but it's kind of a chicken and an egg situation because the peace talks failed. Hamas took it upon them, themselves, you know, not just Hamas, the, the radical Islamist organization, but I'll say Hamas because it's easier. Uh, it's less words. Hamas basically took it upon themselves to derail the peace talks. OK, uh, and they have gained political power in between the first intifada and the second. Now, you could say the reason that Hamas has gained power is the failure of the peace talks, okay? But you could also say the reason that the peace talks failed is that Hamas has gained power and carried out violent, violent attacks, right? So it's kind of a two-way street there. I sure. wouldn't be quick to, to, you know, lay the responsibility at the feet of the, uh, you know, uh, peace talks. And even if you were to lay the responsibility at the feet of the peace talks, um, that, then that wouldn't necessarily mean that the fault is with the Israelis. Uh, so no, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't say that. I, um, I wasn't trying to make some, yeah. you know, purely partisan point that obviously they failed because of the Israelis. I'm um, just a really, um, really yeah. modest point. So, so that's number one. But the there's also number two. Leading to violence. Okay, mm -hmm. because you've spoken about well, the, uh, if you were to have hope, then the the behavior would change. OK, but that's also a two way street because the uh, part of the Israeli public believes a pretty large part after October 7th actually believes that um, it's true that hope uh, moves people into action. But it's not always positive action. As I've as I've stated earlier in this conversation, there is this Palestinian narrative in which the Zionist entity is so close to be destroyed. All we need to do is to resist mm -hmm. a little bit more. You know, the Zionists are fleeing to the airports They're you know, they want to, they just want to flee. So we're still close to, to that. And that's also hope, but that ho that's hope that works in the opposite direction. So sure. another Israeli response would be, well, if you want them to stop acting, what you need is to extinguish their hope of, you know, so that argument about hope is like, it can work both ways. You extinguish their hope to remove the Zionist entity 
and maybe then we can establish hope to discuss uh you know okay so what what is going to be the arrangement here exactly so that people can live good lives um and uh, more well you know you've said the situation is intolerable stuff like that but i guess i don't want it's, it's been talked to death but uh, about the um the amount of financial help that uh, that these organizations have gotten and it doesn't reach the people so you know they they could have they could have actually lived better lives i do agree that that some of that is of course on the israelis but a lot of that is due to failed palestinian leadership and also fa uh, failed palestinian beliefs because the, the leadership is basically feeding on the belief and the belief is that you need to destroy the zionist entity and that's where our resources should be going not to improve your lives right because you're going to have in either way so so this is this is something that i that i've heard so so that the basic point is oh all this money from um international organizations or uh governments in europe goes to um to gazans but it goes through hamas and they spend it on rockets and terror tunnels whatever instead of infrastructure that it's is that the, the basic well yeah but it's also in the west bank it's like extremely corrupt okay. it's it's like sure. the thought of the thought of like it's more important to resist right now than it is to than it is mm -hmm. to lead good lives because actually what matters is you know the the afterlife basically right how how do you say how do you say in in arabic you know my brother died from the israeli bombing yesterday you would say my brother became a shaheed a, a martyr mm -hmm. basically he went sure. to heaven to witness uh, the glory of god right shaheed mm -hmm. means uh, witness yeah. So so I I was I was curious about this and I was trying to substantiate this point one one way or another or at least get some kind of breakdown of like what amount of funds are are diverted um and the 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 thing that I could find was the the German government doing an investigation into the development funding that they were giving to to Gaza. I didn't do as much of an investigation to the West Bank. I know there is a lot of corruption. Uh but just in terms of Gaza because that's like the the biggest thing right now in terms of talking about money going to to Gaza and then just being diverted by Hamas and they were saying that those development funds were not diverted so there there are funds that are diverted which are potentially from charitable organizations um that are from um the fees that Hamas charges for smuggling through the southern border um those are are surely not going generally to enrich and improve the lives of Gazans, but the governmental development funds, um, which is a, a very large portion of that, the, in, the investigations that have been done have shown that those have not been diverted. So this idea that all of the money that's going to Gaza is being diverted into terrorist oh, I activity didn't say or- all. I sure. did not say all, um, but, but yeah, but essentially it's, it's Hamas, you know, there's this funny trick because Hamas, what it does, it says, okay, we have a political wing and we have a government wing and we have a military yeah. wing. So it might be that, you know, the political wing takes the money and then it builds hospitals and it builds, this, uh, uh, you know, jihadi indoctrination schools. And that counts as a school. So it doesn't count as, as uh, you know, diverted into the, uh, you know, uh, Al-Qassam brigades. It's, it's all like once, once you have a governing body that ideologically sees you as father to be sacrificed for the greater uh, good of uh, uh, freeing Palestine, okay? It, it's so hard to make, you know, because it would all be a matter of legal definitions. But in, at the end of the day, I don't think you need all that fancy data because you can just look at the situation and you can say, well, these people have obviously lived very ba bad lives. Yeah. Right? And, and, and right. so where so, is all this money? Where is it? You know? Well, wait, so... Okay, so there's so there's a number of a number of pieces here that they put into play, and I'm I'm trying to kind of sort sort these out. So I'd like to add another thing, if I may. Sure. Uh, well, there's I, I think the I think the axiom of uh, economic relief to the Gazans would be hard to defend today because actually is just a few weeks before the October seventh attacks, uh, Israel has conceded some economic um, things. To the Gazans, you know, to keep Hamas calm, it was it was always a game of keeping it calm. You know, the Qatari money, the uh, some economic concessions, mm -hmm. and what uh, Israel has discovered since then is that is that many of the workers who were permitted to move out of Gaza to work in Israel, so that they can bring money into Gaza, mm -hmm. right? That's that been like a 
long-term arrangement, uh, they have actually been used as scouts to to help the Nokba sure. uh, forces of October seventh. Of, of October seventh. So I think this today, going forward, forward, this will become a problem. Like this sure. axiom uh, is going to be a so problem. So just so just starting with starting at like baseline, and let's see where we can build a shared reality, and then where that where that diverges. So are are the situation for 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 people just generally Gazans? You know, normal people living their lives in Gaza, are the situations currently, or I'm saying currently, but like pre October, October 7th. 7th. Yeah, okay. Um, it, was it the fact that they were living in in pretty pretty rough circumstances? Not not talking about we can we can build up to to okay. why. So, so compared to happened. compared to Israel, yes. Compared to much of the Islamic world, no. But you, normally we compare to what's right next to us. So psychologically, sure. we have to so, say yes. So, so the, yeah. the level of unemployment is something like, I don't know, whatever, 40, 40%. The, the fact that there's not constant electricity, the fact that there's um, lack of clean drinking water, the, the, kind of basic, the kind of basic like UN statistics that are, that are looked at for seeing, you know, how, how, is, how is the population doing? Do do we agree that those were 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 in poor shape? So, uh, so not even I, getting I, into why so whose fault. Agree, I agree with you if you're reality. comparing it. I agree with you if you're comparing it to Israel, to the Gulf states, or to the West in general. Mm -hmm. I don't agree with you if you compare it to the most of the Arab and Islamic world. So, so what's like an example of another country that you would compare to that you think has like comparable statistics? Mm, probably Egypt. Okay. And so, so the level, so like in Egypt, there's like, like blackouts, lack of electricity. There's like ah uh, no no, but, but if, if you were no, but if you were like to look at in water. terms of uh, of uh, GDP and of purchasing power and of life expectancy, uh, that would be roughly comparable. Okay, that's interesting. So, um, if we have another conversation, maybe I'll have a chance to uh, to do that kind of analysis. I can, I can look through that. So, um, so you would say that. The situation was not not great, but it's it's more just like economically depressed, not well, that, not not, look, not flourishing, but not really. Look, like look, it, it, you have to say that it's really bad because if the funding narrative of your society is that of suffering and of well, no, really no, no. I'm not asking, <laughs> I'm not asking like Gaza, Gaza or Hamas. I'm as, I'm asking you, like, how would you? How would you characterize? No, it? no, I would I would characterize this as poor, right? I would really not want to live in Egypt, right? <laughs> okay, but but I'm just saying that it's like you know I've, I guess I've kind of snuck a little bit in there. That's like you know there are other places that you if you were to want to say well because they're so poor and their lives are so terrible there are more places with pretty per terrible lives you know like uh, yeah I mean. Uh, so so just, the problem is the narrative. The mm -hmm. problem is like the foundational narrative of the society of like the reason why we're poor is because these people stole from us and they're living on our land. Uh, for example, I told you about this um, council that met about, well, what are we going to do with the uh, Jews after we've uh, done freeing Palestine, which will obviously happen in the next couple of years. Like that's how they saw it like a year or two ago. They, they foresaw this, right? They foresaw this, but they thought they would win. So... Uh, so what? just so just because I I um you know we're doing this on the internet I happen to have my computer in front of me I was able to actually just quickly Google right. those things and it looks like the Egypt unemployment rate um uh, something like uh, six and a half percent maybe six point seven percent and the Gaza unemployment rate in like 2013 was like eighty percent. That has to be fabricated. I have to say, like, okay, I, I grant you that I will not argue that the Gaza unemployment rate has to be higher than Egypt's for sure, but yeah. that has to be fabricated, you know, like uh, that has to be manipulated somehow. But, yeah. but it, again, I, I would agree with you that that it has a high unemployment, stuff like that. I would also, you no, know, I, it would also I think not I'm surprise seeing this me. pretty much everywhere. Like I'm, I'm just, you know, scrolling through Reuters. Okay, so so why, what my theory would be, like, because it's impossible. You, can't, you, re, mm -hmm. you probably don't have really have a society with 80% unemployment. What I have in my mind probably is that if you are employed for Hamas, it's, you know, it should be some kind of secret because the Israelis would target you. So, you know, you just sign as unemployed you know 
it has to be some sort of manipulation. But I will grant you that the unemployment rate in Gaza is probably very, very high. And like the you know food food insecurity, something like 64 percent. What do you think that, that, that sounds, it is in, in Egypt? That's, in Egypt, it's probably about around fifteen or twenty. But again, that that sound that sounds like it can't possibly be like so, really the case. So. Like, look at life expectancy, uh -huh. look at GDP, you know, it's mm -hmm. probably not. So, yes. So, so I think this is actually, um, this is actually an, an interesting thing to, to focus on. Obviously, we're not going to resolve statistics, you know, what's, what's accurate, what's not, you know, live right at this moment. But I, I think this is actually an interesting, interesting thing to highlight, which is that the, you, you see the, material conditions of Gaza as not um, not in accordance with what the kind of official statistics are. And no, I'm curious, I think it depends it... on the statistics. It depends on what you can easily fabricate. I think it depends. Sure. Okay. Um, like I wouldn't argue with life expectancy. Lying... Uh -huh. but is there a conspiracy, Doran? I mean, Socrates... No, no, no. To... It, it, it's not a conspiracy. It's just that, that these are, are like the, the government is run by an organization which benefits from portraying it as a poor and it is, you know, and all the organizations are benefiting of it. Like take UNRWA, for example. UNRWA benefits mm -hmm. from, from registering high food insecurity. That's how they get their funding. So who do you believe? I mean, Socrates is pointing to some multitude of sources. You're saying they're all... Uh, I, I don't know. Like, I will be... What's the source of truth? No, I didn't say that they're all incorrect. I, I said that I suspect, I highly suspect these seem highly unlikely to me. But actually, I don't think it matters so much because I don't, I don't, like, I don't argue with the... Okay, I might argue with the material truth, but I don't argue with the psychological truth. And I, th I think the psychological truth in this case it actually is actually what matters. Well, so, so can I can I actually dig into this because um, so if if it's the case that um, the the material reality is really 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 far away from what the the psychological reality is. So in Gaza, people believe we're extremely um, pushed down. You know, our uh, our conditions are extremely poor, and obviously it's it's because it's Israel's fault. But 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 just focusing on what what the actual reality is. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, we're in such a terrible state. Um, we're you know in the kind of circumstance that the UN would say, oh, th this is like uh, an extreme emergency just for this population and their living conditions. If people believe this about themselves, wait, we're talking pre October seventh, right? Pre October seventh. Okay. Um. But it's actually not the case. They're actually, you know, they're not in great circumstances. Their GDP isn't amazing. But, you know, it's not it's not extreme. It's just, you know, maybe kind of region consistent, but obviously much worse than Israel, which is one of the startup capitals of the world. Yeah. Uh, they have a lot of I've even done some collaborations with biotech um, in companies that I worked at. Um, then you would say, well, a very you know, reasonable understanding of why that could be the case is they're massively propagandized by their own population. There's these Hamas schools that are teaching them. Um, not only is it Israel's fault, but things are really bad right here. I, I don't even know if I should call it propaganda by this point, you know, mm -hmm. maybe, you know, because now it's, it's, it's like this, it's a, it's a foundational narrative. Exactly. Yeah. You know? We are victims. We're in dire circumstances, I, but everyone if, has, if it were yeah. the case, if it were the case that the material reality actually literally matches it's these 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 statistics like what the true the true values are not the official what's written down or there's some little technical thing that we can say this when it's not really the fact of the matter if those things actually did match then whatever those specific things okay you know, maybe this is Israel's fault, but it, you don't see it that way. Those things might be different. But in terms of the material reality, you know, we are these people who live in these circumstances. If that were actually true, then that form of whatever that narrative is would actually not be a kind of self-victimization. That would simply be just an objective view of reality, right? That's everything I've said is just logically 
consistent, right? I, I haven't said anything. Um, well, I don't think there is there is a, such a thing as an objective view of reality, but yeah. Sure. But, but yeah, I yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mostly, so, broadly, I would agree with uh -huh. you. But, but so I, the, think, I, I think that in order to, so what, what I would need to do to debunk your argument is mm -hmm. to try to argue that, that you, you can like, maybe the dispossession, uh, is not the, you know, the poor state of your lives is not the reason for your aggression. Of course. Right. And to mm -hmm. show that I will need to imagine a hypothetical world in which there was no, not this, you know, uh, poor state of uh, affairs, but you would still be aggressive. And mm -hmm. as we've said before, I can't imagine such a word because it happened. Of course. So, yeah, yeah. so you could, you could shift what the, the status of the, of the argument is and say, okay, maybe it is a fact that you are living in these conditions, but, you know, these these conditions are are a result of other things. It's not persecution. It's not victimization. Or you would be aggressive even if your conditions were good. Exactly, yeah. you, you could you could make all those arguments. But sticking on the argument that that you've made right now that there's this um, narrative, this self victim self victimization narrative that says things are worse than they are. Mm -hmm. If that were actually not the case. Um, W would that affect anything about how you see that population of people? If it turned out that what you saw as self-victimization, narrative, self-brainwashing, brainwashing, brainwashing from Hamas, whatever that is, that that's actually, they're actually right in terms of where their circumstances are, maybe not how they happened or whose fault, but what their circumstances are. Would that change anything for you if it turned so, out? So, so that here's that the actually true. Here's the thing. I'll I'll answer with a philosophical observation. Let's call it that. Okay. So basically, you can have several types of narratives in society. Um, if you were to take, you can have you can have this situation, and let's say that everything is one hundred percent correct. There's eighty percent unemployment. Everyone suffers. Everything sucks. Okay. Worst possible uh, thing. You you still it still doesn't have to make you resist because you could have this uh, narrative um, overarching narrative that says we resist therefore we are right that's basically kind of the Palestinian narrative mm -hmm. uh, and you could have this you know kind of this uh, this is not a, re a religious argument I'm just giving you an yep. example you could have like the uh, ancient Hebrew uh, narrative which says we've done something wrong. Mm -hmm. The reason that this happened to us, the reason, the reason that the temple was destroyed is because we as a, we as a society have sinned against God. We did something wrong. We sure. need to do something different, right? So, so I would argue that, that like the question is, even if it were as bad as, as, as you've described and worse, it still doesn't have to be like, you could build up. But once you're once you're so focused on what other people have done to me, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, you will never get out of it. And by the way, the Palestinian reformers, the, the minority of voices that we're starting to hear, they, this is exactly what these people are saying. They're saying we've mm -hmm. acted absolutely crazy. Okay, and of course, even with these people, I imagine that Israel. Even if these people were one day to be in power and this would be the majority of Palestinian society, Israel would probably still have to make painful concessions. You know, it wouldn't solve the problem, absolutely, mm -hmm. but it would be mm -hmm. a step in the right direction. Yeah. I mean, um, I think generally that's a good like perspective to say, you know, to self-reflect, say, what have I done wrong? What can I do different in the future? Although there there is a certain irony that you said basically that. Israel is is not responsible generally for these circumstances, or or you know to the degree that they're responsible, their actions were justified. Hmm. And right now, there's nothing really proactively that they can that they can do. They can hope maybe there's some vague way. Maybe there's but some they were doing pre October seventh. They were reaching econ economic. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, they there were economic mm -hmm. deals being signed. The, the Gazans were going into Israel to work. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, you know the, the 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 Qatari funds that went into Gaza. The, these were all part of this 
mm -hmm. overarching Israeli conception that, that, you know, only if the economic conditions, if only these were better, then the Gazans would maybe be more peaceful and it would be easier. You know, Hamas would have no need to assault Israel and it would be, you know, you could contain it and kind of live side by side with it, you know. So that was like the, that was like the conception, and that kind of broke on October seventh. But mm -hmm. I, I, it's not that I believe that all Palestinians should be, you know, should live in absolute poverty. I, I don't think so at all. But I, mm -hmm. I do. Okay, so you need to have a, a partner who would not, you know, who who you could build up, mm -hmm. right? So that's a that's a huge challenge, you know, but. Uh, I, th I think, as I've said, I think that's what Netanyahu was trying to do. He would never have said that. But uh, I think that was like the overarching grand move with the Saudis and all that. I think that's what, what was brewing behind the scenes. But I guess now uh, we might not know, uh, at least until the archives are open in a few <laughs> dozen years. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, what do you think in terms of, so now moving to the, to the West Bank, um, the so situations in in Gaza have potentially material um, material problems, and obviously something like what fifty percent of the population of Gaza are under eighteen, and the uh, the blockade, the restriction of movement, has been in place for about eighteen years. So about half the population has never had the opportunity to leave this exact area that they were born in, um, things are um, less restrictive in the, in the West Bank. Material conditions are, are better. Um, you're correct that there's a lot of corruption in, in the government. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of inefficiency. But um, it is a fact that, um, so it's like, you know, for, for people who haven't, who haven't done this, you know, pull up a, a map of the West Bank, look at the areas, you know, the zones A, B, and C, and you see what are these little islands that are forming that are um, Palestinian controlled areas. And then to get from one, you know, if, you're, if your grandma's house is in a different, a different region, then you have to cross a military checkpoint, um, getting searched by the, by the military. Um, and more settlements are being built and more walls are being pushed in. I think if if I were in that circumstance, so I'm I'm an American, I've known freedom all my life. I don't have a, you know, I didn't go to a Hamas school. I'm I'm Jewish. I don't have a uh I certainly don't have a propagandized view of what, you know, life is like or what Israel is like or or whatever. But I can imagine if I were living in a region with a military enforced fence around me that these restrictions are growing year after year after year, decade after decade. These islands are growing smaller and more separated from each other, that are regions that I have some, some real freedom as a, as a person. I can't imagine not feeling like me and my, and my people are being strangled out of their, out of their homes, right? It, uh, that's a very human feeling, isn't it? That's not a simply like a narrative right sure but but it's you know again it kind of fits it to it's into itself in a sense right because the, the reason why you have all these restrictions that are getting worse is because the israelis also feel like there's a constant threat coming from these uh Palestinians. well no that's that's not true because the the settlements that are being built are are people who are you know, who are very religious, who feel the need to expand Israel's territory and to be kind of frontiersmen, right? Mm. Who, feel, who feel the need to move into pioneers. Pioneers, exactly right. They, they feel the need to extend Israel's territory. And so they, they build a settlement. Some of these are deemed illegal by Israel. They're, they're all illegal under international law, but Israel deems some of these um, uh, outposts. So they're non official settlements. Yeah. Some of these, they say, okay, that's illegal. You guys have to leave, and they demolish them. And some of these officially become settlements, so they're recognized by Israel. They say, yep, this is your land, and also will send the, the army to defend you. So if you have some back and forth, 
um, you know, there's Israeli settlers shooting at Palestinians who are living there. If the Palestinians, you know, shoot back or throw rocks back, the the settlers have the the military on their side. This is not a security checkpoint. So, like, you know, the Golan Heights or something, you could say, okay, we've got a military yeah. border so, here. We want to add a buffer zone. This so is not a buffer zone. This is people who want to to take yeah. land and extend Israel's borders. So, so we've actually discussed this before in this in this uh, discussion, right? I've, I've talked about how people see this as a, as a security, um, as something that is actually making Israel more secure. Uh, there's also a religious argument, which I won't make because I believe in making secular arguments. Mm-hmm. Um, but here's the thing. I'm actually, um, I'm, I don't, and I don't feel like I'm good enough at defending the settlements. So I, and I don't want to bash them without being good enough at defending them because I like when I bash something, I like to be good at defending it to make sure that it's bash worthy. So, uh, so I'm, I'm not going to take a stance on either side here. If, if, um, if, if you could give an opinion and then I'll promise not to dig down further. So not to, not to double down on, on bashing. To give you the opportunity to just give whatever your your frank kind of personal opinion is, not to say this is a perfect evaluation or analysis, but just how so you my, feel about this. Element. I'll give you an impression, not an opinion, because mm-hmm. I don't I don't feel like I have to have an opinion about that's everything. fine. Yeah. Okay. So my impression is that a the settlements are probably important for security because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, when you you know. When you hold land just militarily, eventually you'll pull out and you'll get terror nests. That's what you've had in Gaza. That's what you've had in Lebanon. So, so essentially, I do believe that there is an aspect of security here. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, I don't like the friction between the populations at all. And I don't like it when there are illegal assaults on Palestinians and, and when people take their law into their own hands. However, I also believe that um, the Palestinians aren't as, uh, as you know, um, well, aren't as innocent in these occasions as they're portrayed. Let's put it like that. So, so yeah, I, I don't like, I, I'm kind of, you know, I can see kind of both ways here. I'm not very strongly convinced one way or the other. Um, I do think that Israel, that Israel should uh, have control of that territory. It should have some, like some of the cities. Uh, I think the, the Gaza experiment was an important one, as as what happens when you pull out. Um, but I I think that like if there was a way to improve Palestinian lives in the West Bank, and they would not be a threat to the Israelis, uh, I would be perfectly happy with that. So. So, so I was just going to say, if, if you could um, explain, so you mentioned that um, Israel or Israelis should should create settlements in the West Bank. Should... Mm, you know, it's an impression. Mm-hmm. No, I don't, I wouldn't, mm-hmm. it, seem, it seems to me like they should. I'm not very strongly there, but, but, but I think, yeah, I, I think it's, it seems like a probably some measure of that is a good, is a good idea. Mm-hmm. So, so I was just going to ask if you could give like a a really general like idea of 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 how much so like what what proportion of the west bank should additionally so that's currently like um you know zone right c is is Boston. Yeah. okay so so, like, so, so like what i'm actually of zone c i'm actually not a, i'm actually like not that. going to answer the question in the way that you've asked me to i'll try to answer it differently mm-hmm. right i think that this, that the settlers should be law-abiding citizens of the state of Israel. Mm. That means that you're not allowed to go to and start an illegal settlement. You do what the state allows you to do, okay? And you're not allowed to go and bother Palestinians, okay? So, okay, mm-hmm. so that's basically, like, I, will, I, I don't want to answer in proportion of territory. Mm-hmm. I want to answer as general law keeping because mm-hmm. if you if you do not abide by the law that means to me that 
you might not be a good player for my team and mm-hmm. you're just getting me in trouble okay but mm-hmm. if you know if you abide by the like I'll start with that maybe then we can discuss territory because I, I really don't I don't have an answer to your question but if if um so as as happens pretty pretty regularly these outposts are formed and they're illegal at the point that they're formed but then they become recognized legally as settlements is that something that you You now see it as this is this is acceptable or good because now no, it's I, legal or you, or you see it as this is something that causes friction so they even though it's now legal it's within the Israeli framework so, so I, I'd it. prefer I would prefer uh, to not have illegal uh, like illegal per this per Israeli law mm-hmm. okay I would prefer not to have illegal settlements start at all but I'm also not that qualified to give you that answer. Because I might look up some settlements which are I see today as fundamental parts of Israel uh, and discover that they were illegal at the start. but I doubt I doubt that though, because Israel was pushing for some of the early settlements, you know, places mm-hmm. like uh, Modini Little and uh, Ariel and you know the big the big settlements. Mm-hmm. Um, but but yeah, the and then yeah. just I have like one final, I think this will be pretty brief question, which is just so the the founding of those settlements, And if you want to split it up into the ones that are founded starting fully legal or the ones that start as outposts and then become settlements yeah I you, don't have enough enough your background well, about that wait, 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 just, really... um, the the question is so my impression of what you've said is that these settlements increase security they possibly induce friction in, or in certain circumstances induce friction which is probably counter to peace and Yeah. and counter counter to to justice and and well-being and and maybe morally wrong but that overall the settlements are not a major factor in terms of um making relations really really bad or they're they're not they're not one of the top contributing factors. okay they they are they okay they are but also they are like Like mm-hmm. because because if you would say if you were to ask a Palestinian living in the West Bank, he would absolutely one hundred percent list this at the at top three at least, okay? Mm-hmm. But again, if I were to, okay, so let's imagine a world without settlements, but you still get this, you know, we've been there. Uh, so it's a kind of a tricky question to answer. Mm-hmm. so they they probably they are a factor. Um, they're probably overstated by Palestinians in terms of how much of a factor versus what their their true impact versus other factors yeah, probably but but I do I do agree that like yeah I, I like I don't know that much about it as I've said I'm, I don't I don't I'm not like I do know but I don't feel comfortable bashing it either way like I can give you like a balanced perspective I can see some points mm-hmm. in the, uh, here and points there so uh yeah So yeah, okay. that's what I think. Well, so I much. said that that would be my final question. So let me keep keep my word. And Thanks, <laughs> guys. Let me end this recording really quick. How do I do this? Manage recording. Did you did you want to do a quick final final statement or? Oh, I, I, I mean, uh, thank you. I mean, next time. For, I mean, for, for, for Doran and I, if there's um, just one like takeaway that you want to give. Sure. Uh, uh, yeah, Doran, any final statements? Okay, so... Uh, actually, I thought it was a pretty good discussion. It was a pretty good faith. We've had, uh, I think we, we genuinely uh, had to think. And when you have to think, it means it's not boring. Uh, you know, we didn't just regurgitate historical narratives at each, at each other. I think that's a good thing. Um, so, yeah, I think it was a, a, good, uh, a good debate, a good discussion. And um, I don't really have anything to add. I think we've, we've spoken on quite a few topics. How about you, Socrates? Yeah, I, I I enjoyed this discussion a lot. I, I, this felt pretty pretty genuine in terms of um, trying to give personal perspective rather than, as you said, kind of kind of regurgitating talking points, which I, which I really appreciated. Um, I think just on the, the topic as a, as a whole, I think um, this was good for me to see. I think it, it highlighted the degree to which um, actual, fact of the matter over material conditions is a real um, disparate view and something that uh, mistrust over 
official statistics and what the fact of the matter is in different circumstances, I think is something that, that comes into play probably more than we give it credit for, that that's something that's worth uh, putting, putting time into of really trying to, to nail down one way or another what the fact of the matter is. Um, for, for me overall on this, this topic, um, I see, I have for myself why divergences versus what the popular narratives are, which is that people are generally pro-Israel or pro-Palestine or anti-Israel or anti-Palestine. For me, it breaks down more into people who are um, exclusive in who they relate to. So for me, I relate to um, Israelis and Palestinians. Um, I see the state of Israel as a state that I relate to in the sense that it's claimed itself as a, as a Jewish state and represents itself as a Jewish state in the, in the world. Um, it's, a, it's a state that my, my grandparents were very, very heavily invested in, in terms of they, they cared about it very deeply. That generation of Jews has very, very strong feelings about the, the existence and continued existence of Israel. Um, and at the same time, I have a very strong um, relation to the Palestinians who are suffering under what I see as a, um, a state that is, is subjugating and victimizing um, these large groups of people for, uh, a, for concerns other than security. At every given moment, there are security concerns, but the overall, um, the overall flow of the development of the Israeli state is not one that has been primarily focused on security. All right. Thanks, guys. I'm ending the recording. And